Hebrews 10, verse 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to turn good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. Provoke one another. Provoke one another. Now some Christians are pretty provocative, aren't they? Amen. <laughs> we want to be a provoker in a good way. A good way. A good way. To stimulate faith, to stir it up, to encourage it, to consider one another, it says. Consider. It means to take attention to others, to pay attention to other people, to notice others, to fix your eyes on them. It's a present tense as well. It's a continuous consideration. Consider and keep on considering one another. And some ways that we are to provoke, to provoke one another. And the first one it says, provoke unto love. Provoke unto love. We could think of brotherly love. We all could do with that. The love of the brethren. The love of the truth. God's word. The love of the gospel. The love of the church. Our Lord says, love one another. Amen. As I have loved you. Be a lover of God. More than a lover of pleasure. It says, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. We could think of the first love spoken of in the revelation of a church that had lost, had left that first love. And how our first love needs that refreshing, that renewing, that rekindling. We could all do more to love our Lord and for that love to grow. And think of this, how is your love level as it were? We all could do more to love, to love our Lord, to love his people, and to be stirred to a greater love. How we need that, to be provoked, to be stirred is the sense of it, to be disturbed, to be convicted or motivated. This is the sense of it, of the provocation, to provoke unto love. If we could but pray that the Lord would tug at our heartstrings and move on us, that we would be moved, that we would be quickened, made alive, how we need his prompting, his reminding, his prodding all the time. And he takes that sharp sword of his spirit and jabs it, as it were, at hardened hearts. Where is God at in our thinking, our planning, our priorities? Has that love grown less? Or need we provoke it again? I'm sure we could all do more to provoke that love. Do we love him? Love him. Love our Lord. Where has that love gone? It's like someone uh, spoke of how they felt like they weren't as close to God as they used to be. And someone said, well, who moved? Nearer my God to thee. Now draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Do we love him? The word provoke has the sense of excitement, of stimulation, of motivation. That's the sense of this word translated provoke. Have we lost that air of excitement, of being excited about the things of God? That desire, that delight for the things of our Lord. What are we driven by? What is it that is our passion? Our purpose. Do our convictions mean anything? Our character? Or are we complacent? Is it just easy to coast along and grow careless? Let us learn to truly love Him. To love Him. Not a flippant, careless thing, but with all our heart, all our mind, our soul, our strength. He is love. Personified, God is love. He is love. Our Lord incarnates love. Love in the flesh as well as God manifest in the flesh. And we are called to follow in His steps. To be a lover of the truth. A follower of the one who is love. Personified. So how can we? How can we grow in this loving? How can we learn? 
to love and others to grow in His love to manifest it. 1 Peter 1 verse 22 tells us more of this kind of supernatural love, God's love, evident in the church that He loved and gave Himself for. In 1 Peter 1 verse 22 it says, Seeing that ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Unfeigned love. It means not hypocritical. It means the real deal. It means real love. And with a pure heart fervently. Fervently. How can we love like that? How can we make our love real? Make it real. How can we make it happen? That kind of love that Peter writes of there. Perhaps we could consider, how can I be more compassionate for the people in my circle of influence? I was just thinking of late, a work colleague has lost her mother and, and Julie and I sent a card to this lady. Now you just think, even in the worldly sense, worldly people can show love. How much more should we? How much more oughtn't we? People of God, if you are a follower of Him who is love, how oughtn't we to show what the natural world would naturally show to others? And yet, our Lord says to love your enemies. Love your enemies, that's a, a big ask, isn't it? That's a tall order too. How can we be compassionate like that? God's kind of love. It's beyond uh, the the way the world would draw the line, isn't it? God's kind of love. To be compassionate, to pray for one another, as we've done some praying here tonight. We can pray for those and, and we can make a call, uh, as we talked about uh, earlier. Make a call to consider one another, to love one another, to speak the truth in love. Sometimes you need to show some tough love, to talk honestly but lovingly, to listen to one another, to understand one another. Sometimes it's, uh, hi, how are you going? And, and there's something not quite right with someone. You know, you might even find that in church when you come and say good day and you know something's not quite right, someone's not quite having a good day. Uh, and they might need a word of uplifting, of encouraging. Listen and understand. Be kindly affectioned one to another. Forgiving one another. That's God's kind of love. And we're called to love fervently. Love fervently. <coughs> Fervent love. This word in 1 Peter 1.22, fervent love, it's a word translated from a word that comes from a word that means a stretching out as of a hand. This word fervent, it means, uh, it comes from a, a Greek word that means a stretching out of a hand uh, to love. An intense strain, an unceasing activity. It's got that sense of an intensity, of a perseverance, as of an Olympic athlete, if you like. And I, I was just looking at a picture of one of late, and, and it looked, uh, and it was uh, painting a picture of this lady as a, a wonderful Olympic athlete, and, and she looked, uh, wasn't a very flattering photo of her, because she was straining at the finishing line, as it were. And, and you could see that sense that she was just stretching herself to the nth degree. Uh, and yet she was the champion, the winner. And the sense here of this fervent love is of that straining, of that stretching, of that reaching forth, of that zeal, of that striving with all of our energy. That's the kind of intensity that an athlete shows. You know, some of these young lads are playing footy. They've got to put an intensity to win that game, to, to win well to play well. And that's the sense of the kind of love that the Church of God should have. It's absolutely full on, fervent, intense, with a stretching, a maximum output of the muscles, of the stretching to the limit, of the striving with our all. As an Olympic athlete, we want to master their expertise with all their energy. So provoke unto love, and secondly, provoke unto good works. Provoke unto good works. Think of the good works that we are called to undertake. To be provoked to. To be provoked to. Faith, zeal, 
witness, fellowship, to be that healthy, vibrant, growing church. We must be reaching out, taking the message outside the walls, joining the rescue effort, as it were, part of the war effort that we're battling against the forces of darkness. There is a generation growing today with largely very little in the way of morals, in the way of biblical truth, in the way of um, answers. How we need to mobilise and reach out. I know just earlier this afternoon we saw some uh, TV uh, footage and it was all about evolution. You know, one thing after another. There's a brainwashing, a conditioning, a, a saturation of young minds with falsehoods uh, about their beginnings, about man's origins, about creation. And how we need to mobilise and take action and reach out. So we thank God for faithful workers in young people's ministries. We want to reach these young lives while we are able to. And the Christian life is meant to be one of action, of mobilisation, of reaching out. The Christian life is not meant to be boring. It's meant to be a life of action, a life of activity, of good works. There's that word there, works. Works. Now we can sit back on the uh, easy chair, on the uh, glory train, as it were. And, uh, we know our salvation is purchased in full. It's not the works that save us. And yet, as Christians, we want to be active in that life that we live. And it says, provoke unto love and unto good works. God wants his family to be functioning and growing and active. To be doing good, good works, God's works. To be hanging out with God's people. To be part of the action. To be an arm reaching out as part of his outreach to planet Earth. To be rescuing the spiritually dying. We need to be provoked. Every one of us. It's so easy to stay inside our comfort zone and not step out of the comfort zone. We need to be provoked unto love and to good works. It's time to rally, to rouse, to awaken, to ask and allow the Holy Spirit to minister through us that divine heavenly wind from heaven to stir us as the wind would stir and ruffle the feathers, to be provoked, to be fired up, to be convicted and do good. And that means to leave the humdrum, to leave the carelessness of a lax kind of casual Christianity, to stop the wishy-washiness, the she'll be right kind of do nothing attitude and to be provoked, to be provoked, to be galvanised, to be inspired, to do good works, to be a church that is activated, a people that are challenged, that are urging one another on. There's a work to be done, a work to be done. And God wants his church to be at work, to be functioning. I know Julie's got this saying, she likes to say, functioning in excellence. You know, Julie's a bit of a, a, a stickler for everything's just so, and everything's just, uh, she's uh, always, always very particular and very thorough. And we need to be functioning, and functioning in excellence, aspiring to that which is good and godly, to strain and stretch forward with that fervency, with that fervent love, that fervent prayer that was talked about earlier. And if necessary, when we provoked, it might mean we get offended and upset. Hopefully it's the flesh showing its face and we recognise that for what it is. But take action, take action, be provoked unto love and to good works. And sometimes when we provoke, it's really a sign that we are wrong. It could be, and we need the Lord to sort us out. Provoking, it may mean making waves. As God awakens our love and inflames our passion to consecrate us, to motivate us, to activate us, to be provoked, to be worked up and enthused. Good works, you know, was the memory verse earlier tonight. Good works. Faith without works is dead. We don't want to be dead. We want to be alive. We want to be a church that's living and functioning in God's way. 
And so he should be provoked to good works. Oswald Chambers, a famous Christian, said, Do good until it is an unconscious habit of life. And you do not know you are doing it. If you would do good such that you're doing it as a natural course of your life, it's the normal thing for the active Christian to be doing good. Another old-time writer said, this is Barnes, a Christian should always be ready to do good as far as he is able. He should not need to be urged or coaxed or persuaded, but should be so ready always to do good that he will count it a privilege to have the opportunity to do it. It's a privilege to do good. It's not an irksome thing. It's not something, oh no, I've got to do something for God again today. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. You know, Julie and I were just talking early tonight as we're heading out into the cold and wondering how many godly people will be here tonight. And we're glad to see your faces here today. That you were able to brave the, the storm and the wind and the rain and the cold and leave that nice warm lounge room that you might have been sitting in before you came and to be stirred, to be provoked unto good works. And it's a privilege uh, for us to fellowship, to be a, a people gathering together unto his name tonight. And uh, whatever we do unto him, whether it's worship, whether it's fellowship, whether it's, you know, just getting together as God's people, everything and anything we do, it's all due unto his name. The glory is due unto him. As he says to us in John 15 verse 8, without me you can do nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing. You know, our brother Ian led the prayer time beautifully tonight. But he needed the Lord to help him. The words that he said, and Brother Bert, as he read from the Word of God, you all, have, as you've been singing, the Lord has prompted you and helped you and given you that love to fellowship, to be here tonight. And without me, he says, you can do nothing. It's always unto him, unto his glory, God who is at work in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. The will and the work. It comes from him anyway. He gets all the glory. And that's what we want to do, isn't it? I trust that he will be glorified through our work. That in the everyday, the ordinary, something supernatural can happen. God can use you, me, even me, even each one, younger, older, and in between, God can use us if we'll just be available. The works God has for you may be different from the ones He has for me, but we all have a work to do, every one. I know, again, earlier today we were talking, Julie and I, as to, wouldn't it be good to see more people activated? I know it was really a bit embarrassing this morning with the, the song service that uh, as my guitar playing is not always up to the standard we'd aspire to, that there'd be others who may have other abilities that are not stepping up and making themselves available and saying, I can do that. I can be used of God. I've got an ability here that, that's sitting in the dusty shelf and I haven't dusted off for a while, but I can do that. And God helping you, I'd like to do myself out of a job. <laughs> now, I'd like to not be the, I don't want to be a one man band, I never have wanted to be, but sometimes it's, it's sometimes like that, and I don't want it to be like that. So, the works that God has for you, do them, don't hold back, volunteer, find what God has put on your heart to do, what He's enabled you to do, and do it, God helping you to do it. And so, be provoked. Consider one another. Be provoked unto love and to good works. We want that. We want to be encouraged. And it says, forsaking not the assembling of yourselves together. Again, it's a familiar verse and I'm preaching to the converted. You're, you're here in church tonight. You're in, a, you're in the assembly, as it were. But we all can think 
You know, maybe next week you might not feel so enthusiastic. It might be colder. It might be raining more. It might be stormy. It might be, uh, you might be on the way to England. I know some people <laughs> heading off to, off to the fair land of uh, the UK soon. But whatever it be, sometimes we can need an encouragement to fellowship, can't we? You know, I read this earlier, and it said, several years ago, some American prisoners were interviewed. After they'd been prisoners of war, they were interviewed about their experience to find out how the enemy had uh, been most effective in breaking down their spirit, breaking their spirit. And the researchers learnt that the prisoners didn't break down from the physical deprivation and the torture even of their time in this prison camp as quickly as they did from solitary confinement. It was the solitary confinement as they were frequently moved around, separated from their friends. That was what broke their spirit. That was what made them most vulnerable, these soldiers. And they drew their greatest strength, these soldiers, from the close attachments that they formed with the small military units to which they belonged. And it's like that for other, us brothers and sisters, as God's people, as God's family. We draw that strength from that bond that we have with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we need that group experience to, to pull together, to knit together in love and that loyalty to our Lord and to one another. This is a radio Bible class, I've said this, our own personal relationship to God, vital as it is, is not sufficient to produce spiritual maturity and endurance. It's the relationships within a unified, spirit-led body of believers that's essential for growth and for maintaining our individual faithfulness to the Saviour. We're gripped for strength. There's a grouping together of us for strength. Here's another quote from a famous uh, old-time hymn writer, uh, an old-time songwriter, Frances Havergal. Frances Havergal, she wrote many of the songs that we uh, are familiar with, and she gave several reasons for attending church. Here you go, so next week when you feel like you don't want to come, <laughs> next week when you feel it's just a bit, bit uh, miserable, the weather, or whatever your excuse might be, this is what Frances Havergal says to you. Especially on rainy days, she says, no, she's got seven reasons here why it's good to get together in church and assembling with God's people. Number one, God has blessed the Lord's day, making no exceptions for stormy days. It's the Lord's day, number one. Number two, I expect my minister to be there. I would be surprised if he stayed at home because of the weather. Number three, I might lose out on the prayers and the sermon that would have done me great good. Next one, for important business, rain doesn't keep me home. And the church, in God's sight, is very important. Now you've got lots of important appointments, you don't cancel them just because of the rain. You get on with it if it's important business. Number five, bad weather will prove how much I love Christ. True love rarely fails to keep an appointment. True love rarely fails to keep an appointment. How much do you love him? Number six, those who stay home from church because it's rainy frequently miss on fair Sundays too. I mustn't take one step in that direction. You know, it's just so easy, isn't it? One step leads to another step leads to another step. Don't go down that track. Be faithful. And number seven, I don't know how many more Sundays God may give me. It would be poor preparation for my first Sunday in heaven to have slighted my last one on earth. It's good to fellowship. It's good to fellowship. Be provoked unto love and unto good works, not forsaking the assembly of yourselves together. I hope you've been provoked today. We need to be provoked. It can be disturbing, it can be uncomfortable, but God the Holy Spirit is the comforter. And sometimes in giving comfort, He's got to discomfort us when we're in sin and disobedience. He will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. 
What if someone uh, saw uh, the, the house across the road on fire? Wouldn't you want to disturb those people that were still in that house, perhaps sleeping, unaware of the fire? What would you do? You'd yell out, fire! The top of your voice, over and over again, you'd, you'd want to alarm those people and disturb those people and discomfort them. Some discomfort and inconvenience is vital. And friends, if we're slack and sloppy, he wants to convict us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And wake us. It is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. Romans 13, 11, and 1 Corinthians 15, 34, it says, Awake to righteousness and sin not. So wake up. Wake up and be provoked. And provoke others too, to love and to good works. Not forsaking, but encouraging one another. Encouraging one another. As you see the day approaching, exhorting one another. And this word exhorting, it's got the sense of encouraging, of coming alongside and encouraging uh, as, as the comforter uh, allied to that word. And I, I look back as a young boy learning to ride the bike when my dad was there helping me learn how to ride that bike. And he came alongside to help. I can distinctly uh, remember some of that uh, disturbing experience of learning to ride the, the bicycle. And my dad came alongside to encourage and to help. And that's what we are to do for one another. Exhorting one another. Come alongside. Come alongside, as it were, to encourage, to, to rub shoulders with one another. And put uh, your arms around each other, as it were, to exhort one another. Exhortation, it's a wonderful gift, and our Lord calls us to that. And likewise, this word... Um, Exhorting, I'm told that, again, just a quick picture to paint of how this word has a sense. It was used in history to describe how, where a military regiment had lost heart and was dejected and feeling uh, that they had lost the battle, a general sent a leader to this unit, this army unit, to talk to the disheartened soldiers. And as the man came and enlivened them and encouraged them, their courage was reborn. This body of dispirited men became fit again for heroic action. As this man came and exhorted them, he encouraged them. And this is the very same word that we see here in Hebrews 10, 25, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Exhorting. It's got the sense as, as this military unit was encouraged to get back in the fight and to take heart to fight the battles ahead. And that's what church does for us. That's what the assembling of ourselves together does for us. It provokes unto love, unto good works. It encourages and we encourage one another. And it's not the church as in a building or, or even a meeting, but it's you and me, brothers and sisters, knitted together in love, caring for one another, doing his works, and exhorting one another, considering one another, looking out for one another. So and so is not here tonight. Maybe I could give them a call. That's considering one another. That's considering one another. That's, that's, it's got the sense of looking out for one another and we, we try to make that practice although it gets hard when we've got numbers of people to try to catch up with it doesn't always happen maybe you could help me if, you, if you'd like to play a role in that if you've got a phone at your house and you'd like to make some calls there's numbers of people that haven't come to church this morning was quite sparse this morning uh, there's numbers of people not well in this fellowship we want to consider one another look out for one another Provoke unto love, provoke unto good works, and exhort one another, and so much the more. The day is approaching. The day, the day of the Lord is coming. It's at hand. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to be that prepared people for your returning. Stir our hearts, Lord.
Convict us, Holy Spirit, that we might be more in tune with your will and to will and to do of your good pleasure. Help us, Lord, to find opportunities to do good works. And We see the world around us does lots of good works and yet we, as your people, ought to be the ones who set the example to the world. Help us, Lord, to be that people, to love the brethren, to love the assembling, to love our Lord and Master, our Saviour. Lord, help us to be that kind of people. And considering one another and exhorting and encouraging one another as we see time is ticking out and we know, Lord, it's just ever closer. You're returning. You're looking for a people ready. We pray, Lord, if there's any present here tonight that they've yet to trust you, that they don't know what it means to have everlasting life. Lord, let them be drawn to you, we pray. Let your Holy Spirit work, we pray, and bring comfort, bring conviction. Holy Spirit, Lord, minister, we pray. We pray for every heavy heart, if there's people loaded down with concerns, lift them up, Lord, we pray. Let them leave this place with a spring in their step, having been encouraged, having found the comfort of the Scriptures tonight, as well as the comforter to their soul. Lord, for the comfort of salvation, the gift that we have, and just the privilege to be brothers and sisters here tonight and to be able to spend time with each other. Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name.